I'll be honest, I inherited a mess, a, a real mess. I mean, all the charges were already out there in stone. And the liability uh, was clear. It wasn't a triable case. Um, and so, you know, he was looking at 30 years or, ex in, or in excess of 30 years. And uh, I have for the last 20 months in um, a lot of different ways mitigated the damage. What you just heard was recorded outside the federal courthouse in downtown Orlando. Fritz Scheller, the defense attorney for Joel Greenberg, was reacting to the sentence handed down to his client minutes earlier. 11 years in federal prison. That's the punishment U.S. District Judge Gregory Presnell gave Greenberg, Seminole County's former tax collector, for carrying out a staggeringly broad crime spree that the judge a day earlier described as having no precedent. Though the judge suggested he felt the sentence was perhaps too lenient, it was at the top end of federal guidelines, factoring in the credit that government prosecutors gave Greenberg for his cooperation in their investigations into his former friends and allies. Fritz Scheller fought hard for Greenberg to get full credit for that help. I take great pride in the process and the effort I put in. I think that was confirmed by the judge's, um, who's a great judge, the judge's comments about thinking that the guidelines that we arrived at were too low. So um, that's part of a job of any good attorney to um, try to narrow uh, try to narrow the playing field, limit the playing field. So what that tells me is that uh, I saved him a great big deal of time. On the other hand, I'm never I'm never happy with prison sentences and um, you know but that's the reality and that's a result of his conduct. And so in the end it was a just sentence. Greenberg has been in the Orange County Jail for nearly two years, and he'll get credit for that time. The man who not too long ago was seen as a rising star in Florida GOP politics, and an ally of far-right luminaries like Roger Stone and Matt Gates, will spend several years behind bars in a federal penitentiary. But he'll still be a relatively young man, in his mid-40s most likely, when he's set free. After completing his prison term, Greenberg will be under supervision for 10 years in order to participate in substance abuse and mental health treatment, and he'll be a sex offender for the rest of his life. In less than four years as Seminole County's tax collector, Greenberg trafficked a teenager, stalked a political rival, stole multiple identities, and spent taxpayer funds on paid sex and cryptocurrency, while doling out lucrative no-work contracts and bogus jobs to friends and allies among a laundry list of other misdeeds and controversies. Can a man capable of so much corruption be rehabilitated? That remains to be seen. During his sentencing hearing, Greenberg read a statement in which he accepted responsibility and apologized to his victims, to the taxpayers, to his parents, his ex-wife, and his children. That statement, he wrote it out. Um and I think it genuinely uh, showed his remorse. So I was, I was pleased with that. Yeah. Usually I have to tweak a client's statement. Um, I did in his case. So there's genuine remorse there. Hello, and welcome to Joel Greenberg, The Man, The Scandal, The Players, brought to you by the Orlando Sentinel. I'm your host, Jeff Wiener. Joel Greenberg was arrested in June of 2020. He pleaded guilty to six federal offenses in May of 2021. Finally, on Thursday, he learned his fate. It was a long time coming, the conclusion of one of the most stunning cases of political corruption in state history. But is it the conclusion? Fritz Scheller says no. He told reporters at least two other people locally are likely to be indicted soon, and he hopes more will follow. Scheller said Greenberg gave testimony against 24 people about widespread misconduct ranging from sex crimes to COVID-19 relief fraud and election corruption. Whether prosecutors at the Department of Justice will pursue those cases remains to be seen. Standing outside the courthouse, Scheller suggested that if they don't, they'd be letting some powerful people off the hook. I think sometimes that, you know, the prosecution of a person like Joel Greenberg gives us a sense of complacency, like everything is all right and justice has been done, right? And 
really then sometimes the more culpable escape. Bigger fish. A lot bigger fish. The judgment was handed down in a courtroom at the federal courthouse in downtown Orlando, in a hearing that lasted less than two hours. No cameras or recording devices are allowed in that courthouse, so we can't bring you audio from the proceedings. But the Sentinel's Martin Comis was there to witness the proceedings. Martin has been covering Joel Greenberg for as long as anyone, from his improbable defeat of a longtime incumbent to become tax collector, through all of his controversies while in office, and throughout his downfall, writing about each new allegation and revelation. I interviewed him, uh, you know, over the past six years, dozens of times. And there was always that sense of, you know, I'm smarter than everybody else. I'm, I'm, I'm wealthier than everybody else. I'm, you know, I, he just had this sense of bravado. Greenberg retained that swagger even after his initial arrest, when he appeared before a judge to plead not guilty to stalking charges before being released to await trial. But Greenberg soon violated his bond conditions, driving to Jupiter in search of his wife despite court-ordered travel restrictions, which led to his arrest in March of 2021. Ever since then, he's been in a secure detention area of the Orange County Jail, housed for much of that time in the same pod as convicted cop killer Markeith Lloyd. He has also been put on new medications, according to his attorney, and has given numerous interviews to state and federal investigators about corruption in local politics. According to Martin and other observers, the nearly two years since we last saw Joel Greenberg seemed to have changed him. His demeanor is different. His swagger is gone. The reality of his situation, seemingly, has set in. Well, today was an interesting day because it was one of the first times that we had seen Joel Greenberg since uh, he was uh, last arrested back in early 2021. He was wearing a blue prison jumpsuit, white prison shoes. He was shackled at the ankles, although not on his hands. He walked in with two uh, U.S. Marshals. He calmly sat down, and he had a much more uh, serious look about him. Greenberg's sentencing presented a unique challenge, even for U.S. District Judge Gregory Presnell, who was appointed to the bench by President Bill Clinton in June of 2000. Well, Judge uh, Gregory Presnell has been around a long time. He's been doing this uh, in federal court since, uh, you know, the 22, 22 years or so. And he pointed that out a couple of times. He's also pointed out a couple of times that he had sentenced over 1,000 people to prison. He said it never, ever is easy. And, and he said, but in this case, this is just the most unusual case that he has ever come across. The challenge for the judge in determining Greenberg's sentence was reconciling the help he has provided to federal investigators against the staggering breadth of Greenberg's offenses, which began as soon as he entered elected office and continued until after his arrest, all in less than four years of public life and in violation of the public's trust. One of the main points that he said is just because the crimes are so varied and the crimes were all committed within such a relatively short period of time. You know, usually when defendants go to court and they get several crimes, they face several charges. Those charges are usually linked together to one specific event. That was not the case here. And that's something that uh, Judge Presnell pointed out a couple of times. You've got sex trafficking of a minor. You've got um, a, a identity theft. You've got creating fake IDs using taxpayer equipment. You've got um, buying machines to mine data for cryptocurrency. It just almost runs the gamut. And that's something that I think uh, Judge Presnell did say is that he struggled with how, what is the appropriate sentence for this? Normally at a sentencing hearing, the front row of the defendant's side of the courtroom gallery is filled with their friends and family. The idea is to present the judge with evidence that the accused has a support system, but also is, at heart, a good and well-liked person. Defense lawyers often also present letters from supporters who can't be there in person, attesting to the defendant's character and value to society. There was no such show of support for Joel Greenberg on Thursday. Instead of family and friends, those sitting behind Greenberg included one of his victims, Brian Butte, and representatives of Seminole County's government and the tax office that he left in shambles. We did not see any of the family members there. We did not see any of his friends there. 
the people who did show up in that part of the courtroom were obviously Brian Butte, his attorney, David Baer. It was also the county attorney and acting county manager, Brian Applegate, was there. The current tax collector, uh, J.R. Crow, was there. Greenberg's defense filed just two letters in support of him, both from friends who attested to good deeds years or decades in the past. One wrote about his memories of traveling with Greenberg's family after they moved to his neighborhood in 1992. Scheller also told the court that Greenberg had been cut out of his parents' will. Greenberg's family owns an empire of dental offices and repeatedly bailed him out, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans, while he was scrambling to cover up having stolen from his public office, though there's no indication his loved ones knew what he was up to. Clearly, even in the eyes of those close to him, Greenberg has a lot to atone for. He began that process Thursday, using his opportunity to speak before his sentencing to apologize to family members who weren't there to hear it, and to his victims, including the taxpayers of Seminole County. We'll never know if he was sincere, but according to Martin, his delivery was persuasive. The U.S. judge gave him an opportunity to read a statement or make a statement, and Gregory Presnell offered him the option of either staying in his seat, which most defendants do do, or he could walk up to the microphone and speak, and Joel Greenberg decided to walk up to the microphone. He pulled out a yellow sheet of paper that it was torn from a legal pad, and he unfolded it, and he spoke for about three or four minutes. Greenberg was contrite, apologetic, and remorseful, and he didn't ask for his freedom or for leniency. Whether that reflects a genuine understanding of the harm he did, or just a performance of shame, remains to be seen. He said, I feel remorse for for what I have done. I let you down and betrayed your trust. And that was basically the end of his statement. As he laid out his rationale for Greenberg's sentence, Judge Presnell singled out one of the elected officials' crimes as, quote, the most horrendous of all, unquote. That crime? The stalking of Brian Butte a local private school teacher who filed to run against Greenberg for tax collector in 2019. Greenberg embarked on a smear campaign against Butte, coordinating anonymous letters that were sent to Butte's school, falsely claiming he had sexually abused a student. Greenberg also created social media profiles in Butte's name that falsely portrayed him as a white supremacist. We covered this in episode seven. The ordeal derailed Butte's candidacy and upended his life. It was also the basis for the first indictment against Greenberg, the one that prompted his resignation from office and fall into disgrace. Butte has since become a vocal advocate for stricter scrutiny of tax collectors and other elected officials by the state to ensure that abuses like those Greenberg perpetrated while in office will not be allowed to occur again. He delivered that message again to reporters Thursday before Greenberg's sentencing, and also discussed the case's personal toll, not just on him, but also his loved ones. As for my family, we've transformed and grown through unspeakable pain during the past 38 months. By the grace of God, there have been birthdays, graduations, and new life chapters beginning. We've learned that although the wounds will lessen, the scars will remain, but we're determined to move forward. Our story is definitely unique. Most people can't believe it when I tell them. Butte sat in court for Greenberg's sentencing. Of those to whom the former tax collector apologized personally, a list that included Greenberg's now ex-wife, his parents, and his kids, Butte was the only one present to hear it. He also listened as Presnell, the judge, described what Greenberg had done to him as, quote, downright evil, unquote. Speaking to reporters again afterwards, Butte processed that scene. He also stressed that he doesn't believe Greenberg acted alone in constructing the elaborate effort to besmirch his good name and destroy his career. I don't know Joel, but I did hear him apologize specifically specifically to me today. I don't know what was going on. I accept it. I've accepted it a long time ago. I don't characterize Joel as an evil person. I'm not convinced, personally, that Joel, that this was Joel's idea. I'm not convinced. Butte has reason to think that. Early court filings in Greenberg's case made reference to an unindicted co-conspirator who was involved with Greenberg in the smear campaign against Butte. That person has never been identified publicly and their role remains unclear. As did Fritz Scheller, 
Butte said he hoped prosecutors will continue their work with Greenberg to build cases against those who joined him in his misconduct, but haven't been made to face consequences. I'm really impressed with how both sides work together. That's my observation. I was never in, you know, deep, you know, deep meeting, meetings with, with, with either side at all. But it is very clear to me that the law was defended. The judge was sensitive to all the mitigating factors. And Mr. Scheller did an excellent job representing his client. And I believe that his client, I do believe that he has been in a process of, of making amends. Thank you. That's the end of this episode. We hope you've enjoyed it. It was produced by the Sentinel's Wesley Alden and featured reporting from Martin Comas. With Greenberg's case drawing to a close, this may be our last episode. Or it may not. That'll depend on whether other cases and other charges continue to emerge as a result of Greenberg's cooperation with investigators. We'll follow the investigation where it leads. In the meantime, please stay subscribed on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate it. And as always, you can continue to follow our coverage of this saga at orlandosentinel.com slash Greenberg. <laughs>